Segabits presents Sega Talk, a podcast talking all things with your hosts, George and Barry. Look, it's a giant talking egg. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the master here. So what's Hello and welcome to episode 65 of Sega Talk, the all new, all green Sega Talk. I'm Barry. With me is George. Hello, everyone. Hello, and we are going to be... My intro is wanna... just like, just so flat compared to yours. You had like the hat intro. I should have, I felt like maybe, I don't know, I should have worn a, a, some sort of hat too. I'll tell you, $7 at Michael's you can get these, <laughs> Michael's Crafts. That's um, all it takes yeah. to be a pimp. So, you know, I, I put it on there because I thought, you know, it would help our demographics, bring in some ladies who like... Uh, like fedoras, right? Is that a thing? I um, think so. <laughs> so, uh, before we get into the show, though, if you, you know what, I'll take the fedora off. Maybe this will help our cause. Um, if you'd like to support us, uh, you can check us out on Patreon. We got a lot of fun tiers there. You can dictate what we talk about. Um, any level, you can leave your memories at the end. We have some really exciting memories on this one, let me tell you. Uh, but let's jump right into it. I'm looking forward to this one. We are going to be talking about Quack Shot, starring Donald Duck from 1991. This game was released in December, so it's a Christmas release. Though it's one of those games that released so close to Christmas, I don't think many kids got it for Christmas. It's more like a gift card game. Mm. Um, I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know why they didn't do the like November. That would have been cooler. Anyway, um, what's interesting though is it was uh, near simultaneous worldwide release the game hit america on the 19th it hit japan on the 20th and we don't know the date for europe so if you're from europe and you remember getting this like on release day let us know but i'm pretty sure it would be like around there uh the game was licensed by the walt disney company and developed by sega csr and d which is short for sega consumer research and development department that's a mouthful um I love how I love those early days of Sega where everything sounds like robots. You yeah. know what I mean? Like there's no they, they they don't really think, well, no one's going to see the name of this development studio, so let's just call it by the internal name. Um I don't know. I would have called it something more fun than that, but sounds like a sci-fi movie a, show. Like a sci-fi movie when you see like the robotic labs and how they call each unit, that's what it sounds like they would call it. Like mm-hmm. CSR. I know, right? Sir, we've got a brand new Terminator out of R&D coming. Um, The game was a follow-up to Sega's highly successful Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse, which was developed by Sega R&D2. Hey, the D2. Hey, that's a callback to the previous episode. Um, And it shared many key staff members with Castle of Illusion and Quackshot. So the game is best described as being a non-linear action platforming game starring who else but Donald Duck and the game borrows heavily from Indiana Jones and has nods to the classic Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge comic books which were made famous by artist and writer Carl Barks. So first off before we uh, jump into the duck pond start quacking um, I want to know when did you first become aware of Quack Shot and do you have any memories of this game? Um it, this is one of the like when I was a kid, we all my cu- like all our family was kind of like obsessed with the classic Disney and like movies and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. one of my cousins would have like a mermaid game, Little Mermaid game that they did, or Lion King, and uh, one of my cousins had this one, and uh, we played it. But like my problem at the time was I couldn't figure out the whole backtracking thing that well. I was kind of young. So mm. it, it, I always got stuck in that. So we would always go and play like another game, like um, one that we, I mean, I, I, that's where I usually played Aladdin. That was my favorite one on the Genesis was Aladdin. So. That's an awesome game. Yeah. Yeah. So I would definitely play that. But going back now and playing it, this is a hidden gem definitely because it, it really did get overshadowed by the Mickey game. And yeah. I don't think that many people know about it. And it really does feel like, literally the same team made the game like the feel the pixel graphics and the art um some of the animation um i like you said it's also inspired by indiana jones uh, indiana jones which is a really good set of movies and obviously Mm -hmm. something good but i never knew that it was actually based on old comics 
Because, mm-hmm. like, the only thing at the time that I knew about, uh, you know, Donald Duck was the DuckTales stuff, so. Right, yeah. yeah. So we're going to give you an education on the duck. The Duckmeister General, as we call him. Um, not really. Uh, <laughs> as for me, this was one of the very first games I got for the Genesis after getting it uh, Christmas 91 with Sonic packed in. Um, I can't say for sure if I got it new, but knowing my dad, he probably got me this maybe the same month. I, I might have gotten this. It was. I, I'm pretty certain it was a Christmas present, um, but... Uh, you know, I mean, I have my copy here. It's very old, very worn and kind of a telltale sign that it was one of my early games is it has a Nintendo like ownership sticker on the back. You see that? Oh yeah. And my only other game that has that is, um, Sonic one. So these were like the early games in my library. I had those little stickers and I was very clearly like going, well, you know, I don't want to lose Sonic and I don't want to lose Donald. So I'll put these like name labels <laughs> on them. Um, but yeah, it's a very, it says a lot about the quality of the Sega clamshell cases. I've had this game since 1981. I played it nonstop, you know, took it with me to visit like my cabin. Like I'd pack up the Genesis, you know, it's gone everywhere. But look how nice this looks like. Yeah, I, I really miss that type of packaging. I, I know people say that it's, like, terrible for the environment, but I'm like, bro, it's going to be on my shelf for, like, a thousand years, so who cares? The price right, is fine. exactly. It's part of my environment now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but, you know, I just, I have really fond memories of this game. Uh, this, along with Sonic and Ghostbusters, were kind of like the Holy Trinity, like, games I just played. No, I would say four. So whatever the Holy Four is. Um, Hyperstone Heist would be the other one. Games I just played constantly. Um, and you still swear enough, by though, Hyperstone St- Heist. There's a lot of haters on Hyperstone Heist online. I love it. I want it. I'm looking forward to us covering it because um, I think it's it's a fair comparison to make to Turtles in Time. And I would concede on a few points, but all in all, like Hyperstone Heist is my jam. You know, like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bow out just because oh uh, there's more colors you can throw people. You know, I'm not going to do yeah. that. But um, until we get to that with this game, though, it was just um, it was just so much fun. Um, I love the nonlinear aspect to it. Once you kind of figure that out, it really opens up a whole interesting and fun way to play. And, and we'll get into all of that. But uh, one thing I did want to cover, too, is the Japanese naming for these games. They're very goofy. So in Japan, Quackshot starring Donald Duck was known as Quackshot. I love Donald Duck. The Treasure of King Garuzia. And Castle of Illusion was titled I Love Mickey Mouse, Mysterious Castle Adventure. And then World of Illusion, starring Mickey and Donald, was titled I Love Mickey and Donald, Mysterious Magic Box. (laughs) So um, there were also several of Illusion games. I don't know if you've played any of them. There was Legend of Illusion, Land of Illusion... Um, I think even the Epic Mickey 3DS game used the illusion title Power of Illusion, I think. Yeah. Um, but really, like all of those games, which are on Mega Drive, Master System, Game Gear, they're bunched into the illusion series. This is kind of pushed aside, which I think is why it's kind of forgotten. But in Japan, it very clearly is the I Love trilogy. So much so that there was a uh, Saturn Sega Ages release, which I didn't put in the notes here, but it's um, Castle of Illusion and Quackshot. So, you know, that happened. (laughs) But um, (laughs) what are your thoughts on these different titles? And did you ever like view Castle, Quackshot and World as like their own little trilogy? No, because like I kind of felt like... uh... At the time, like you said, uh, uh, Sega was doing other games on like the Game Gear, the whatever, mm-hmm. uh, the Master System, and they were all called Castle of like something of Illusion. And I thought those were their own thing. And then the maybe the the Donald stuff was Donald Duck stuff that was like loosely based on it. It's kind of like Ducktales is part of the Mickey universe, but if you watch Ducktales, it felt feels like you're watching totally a different world, um, right? So that's how I felt it was. I I never thought it was a trilogy, but I love series would make sense because I mean they were made as a trilogy in Japan. I don't. 
But it's just weird. What do you think about rebranding it of Illusion type? And do you think this should have been called like Quack Shot of Illusion starting? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's the that's the whole problem. Is like if you bring of Illusion in, where is the illusion? It's a very clear clear cut action adventure game. You know, there's maps and puzzles and keys. Nothing like Mickey where there's real magic going on. Um, the only way I could really view it as like a trilogy is that you have Mickey's game, you have Donald's game, and then you have Mickey and Donald. It's like Batman, Superman, Batman versus Superman, you know, like, I don't know. Um, there are, you know, some gameplay similarities, some, I guess you could say like UI, um, and art style and music similarities, but it's not like going from Sonic 1, 2, and 3. It does very much feel like three different platforming games with loose similarities. Even the art, I would mm. say, between those three games are very different. Like Castle of Illusion looks very dated as a as a Mega Drive Genesis game. Like obviously because it's a er- very early one. Quackshot's a lot more in line with maybe Sonic or Sonic Two, and then the uh, World of Illusion really is like up there in terms of quality of sprites. Almost like more in line with the Aladdin game. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it's not really that consistent, but that's not really a bad thing. I mean, they're all great games, but they're all very different. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about Daffy Duck. No, wait, Donald Duck. And, um, we've got a picture of him here, the evolution. Oh yeah, I got that. Uh, (laughs) Um, I don't really know how to speak to these just because... I can kind of tell some are from some eras. I don't know how accurate some of these are. Like, you know, you could you could say Sonic show a timeline of Sonic and be showing two things from the same year and they look completely different. But um, gives you a good idea of where Donald has gone from 1934 through to modern day. Um, so Donald Duck, he was not created for this game. Surprisingly, he's actually a wow. very old character. Are you yeah. serious? Um, wow. Yeah, I know. It wasn't Yuji Naka that created Donald. He goes, oh, Donald the Duck. Okay, um, I thought no, they were Sega happen. games. Then they started there. They said, we'll make a couple comics, see what happens. Like well, Cuphead, so. where they made all these like fake 1930s shorts, right? It's going to have, it's gonna have um, a Netflix show soon. Yeah, it is. No, um, so Donald, he first appeared in a 1934 shirt, shirt, short titled The Wise Little Hen, which in turn was actually based on a story called The Little Red Hen. And I actually went so far as to read the original story. And um, Donald and his buddy in the in the cartoon, Peter Pig, they're actually original characters from the Disney version of the story. And the story involves this um, hen asking her neighbors, who are Donald and Peter, to help her grow and harvest and bake the ingredients for a dinner she's doing like if you've ever seen it it's it's kind of an earworm like the song goes will you help me make my corn will you help me make my corn with any luck donald duck will help her make her corn and then she's like will you help me and he goes oh my tummy hurts i can't i'm sick (laughs) it's really funny why didn't Peter Pig become a big character? I'm looking at his picture right now, and he looks pretty sick, dude. He's got a little, like, That's the thing. T-shirt on. He, he, he didn't, but of course, you know, Disney fans and, like, people who grew up on this cartoon and later worked for the company, they'd throw Easter eggs in. So there would be, like, times where Donald and Peter would, like, reunite. Oh. Um, like, on that show, what is it, House of Mouse, which was, like, a big fan service fest. Uh, so there, there were moments like that, but... Sadly, yeah, Peter Pig, he um, he didn't make the cut. And unfortunately, at the end of the cartoon, too, they don't get to eat dinner because they didn't help. The hen's like, mm. no, you don't get it. And so it's it's really interesting that, you know, despite being initially just created as a tool for like a lesson in a cartoon, uh, that kind of created Donald's personality. He was, because the cartoon was a fable, he was supposed to be naughty he was supposed to be grumpy. He was supposed to kind of have like mood swings, you know. And then the goofy speech was just because all the animals in the story all talked like the animals. So the hen would just be like, wah, 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 wah. and then the pig would be like, wah, 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 wah. and so of course Donald would be like, let me see if I can do it. He'd be like, uh oh, you know, like that's that. That's pretty good. Right? That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. 
what what's really interesting too is that same year they brought Donald back. So I don't know if there was like fan reaction or just like internally um Disney was like this character is great, let's bring him back. So he became a foil to Mickey in the short f- film uh Orphan's Benefit, which later cemented his status as a classic Disney character and a member of the main cast of Mickey and his friends. Um some might argue that Donald eclipsed Mickey in several areas, including appearing in more theatrical shorts and being more prolific in comic books, both in the U S and abroad. I'm sure if you're listening to this in Europe, you know, all about like, I don't know, like the Italian Donald and uncle Scrooge comics, completely different thing. Kind of like Sonic, the comic compared to Archie Sonic, like over there. They're I like, Oh, read, it's yeah. Yeah. I did read about it. That it's like a ph- phenomenon because the way that it was localized, it was like, mm-hmm. it hit all the right notes for the audience. It was meant to. So, that's pretty good. You got to really got to give it to localization. Maybe sometimes changing a little bit of things for like certain markets is, is a good thing if it makes oh, it more money, right? Absolutely. I mean, it really it really took off. And then uh, you have people over here who are like, oh, more more Donald content, so they're buying translations of the Italian books. It's just kind of mm. crazy. Um, so yeah, uh, Donald. He also uh, had an extended family that saw the creation of Uncle Scrooge McDuck who was created by longtime Disney comics writer and artist Carl Barks, whose work went on to influence filmmakers who include Steven Spielberg and George Lucas and the DuckTales animated series. So with that in mind, I wanted to take a look at some of Carl Barks's art here. So we're looking at, I believe, a comic book Wow, uh, the, way this, the way these pictures all came through, like they're all bad. It's like all the levels. I don't know. Did you? I guess. Oh, I, really? I, I should have seen the order of them. My bad. I found it right now, though. But wow. Oh, okay. But it's so weird. They put all the screenshots early in, even though they're not numbered that way. But oh, anyway, strange. I, I'm, I'm I'm looking at the comic book here, though. Yeah, yeah. So we've got here. This is Donald with his, I think, his cousin, Gladstone. Um, but you know, you can get a good idea of just you know all the. How expressive he makes the characters, all the little things like the wrinkle on Donald's bill when he gets mad, twirling his cap. So there's definitely a lot of uh, character and personality. It's not just like he was doing a licensed comic book. Um, and then the next little bit you can see here, we have a uh, very nice painting that uh, Carl Barks actually did. He did tons of these. I, it's a little out of reach from me, but I have a, a whole book of them uh, over there that my dad gave me. Um so I mean, sec, just really, really nice quality stuff. You just have to rename it. Sorry. I got oh, that's it. fine. It's. Uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to get the painting up. Sorry, why you talk about? Oh, it. that's okay. Because it's pretty. Simple. Um. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start reading here. So uh, yeah, Barks. He originally worked at Disney in the 1930s as an in betweener for the animation department, and I, I do believe an in betweener is the person who would take. Uh, let's say you're you're like the main animator and you do someone doing like putting their hand up and then the next frame has it down. The in-betweener would draw those frames in between. So it was kind of the animation department bitch. But, you know, it's it's one way to make your way up in the world. Um, he also contributed art to Donald Duck's first comic book, which was called Donald Duck Finds Pirate Gold. And when World War II hit, Barks actually quit Disney and he moved to start a poultry farm. And to fund his farm, which is kind of ironic, he's writing about ducks and he like wants to raise like ducks and chickens. Um, to fund his farm, he actually pitched the idea of making Donald Duck comics for the publisher Western Publishing, who published the book Pirate Gold. So they quickly approved him, and from there on, like Barks went on to write and draw over 500 stories. But due to Disney policy about writers being anonymous, he was only known to fans as the good duck artist until his identity identity was discovered in 1959. And I think as Sega fans, that's not, it's nothing new to us to have anonymous. Like it's, it's yeah. kind of ironic that the staff of this Donald Duck game are anonymous because they, again, like Sega of Japan and J- Japanese developers in general would not put people's names out there. I think for fear of them being sniped you know, from another company. Um, so yeah, we have a game 
based on an unknown comics creator from an unknown development team, which is kind of funny. Um, but we, we could talk about Donald Duck all day. And before we start talking about Quackshot, I did want to know, what are your thoughts on Donald Duck as a character? And have you ever read any of the comics or watched any of the cartoons, either like the old shorts or the, the newer stuff? Um, Donald Duck as a character, when we were looking at the character art, I would say that my favorite is obviously like probably the third one to the back. I'm trying to find the picture again, but the, I don't know. Oh, I, I see think it, yeah. I think, I think I'm going to have to restart this image thing a little bit, but. Oh, that's okay. Donald yeah, the, the is one of those one weird. From... Sorry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was going to say my, my thing with Donald is that like, he's a, a classic character. I think he's really cool. I have like a, uh, a lot of fond memories watching some of his stuff. When I was a kid, my first. Donald Duck cartoon that I watched was probably the Three Amigos. You remember that? Oh, the um, the one with the with the the, the, the bird from the like, Three uh, Caballeros. Caballeros. There you go, Three Amigos. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to watch Amigos. that all the time. Yeah, 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 it was basically the Three Amigos. We used to have it on VHS. You probably had the same copy, the one with the yeah. you know, yeah, when they used to come in those clamshell things. And uh, I used to watch it nonstop. Mom used to, mom was like a huge fan of it because first. Mm-hmm. They used to have these, like, mom, like, she grew up having birds all her life. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, this is a movie about, and it's not only that, it has a, a rooster from Mexico, and then it has the Colombian, right. I think, uh, parrot. Yeah. She's a big fan of parrots, so she's used. Uh, so I think his she, name was Joe Carioca or something like that. Yeah, yeah. He was the yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, guy or whatever. There's so many great moments in that movie. I like when they go, Donald, have you been to Bahia? And he goes, uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> Donald! You haven't been to Bahia? Ah, uh-uh. oh, Donald! When you go to Bahia, and he starts singing about Bahia, yeah. remember? That? Yeah, 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 yeah. Great, great movie. Um, I heard yeah. that it, I heard somebody was telling me that it was like banned or something because of like the way it handles culture or whatever. I don't know. I thought it was supposed to be made because like Disney wanted to open up Dis- uh, Disney characters to like South America and in like those kind of places. So, you I know, know, I can I... tell you, um, Three Caballeros, and I think there was another movie called Saludos Amigos. And these are these are both actually on Disney Plus right now. You can check them out. Oh, okay, it's um, not Ben. Thank God. Right. They, they they um were I believe because the U.S. government had a uh, relations going with the with South America, and they wanted to in, endorse like uh, friendship between countries and tourism. And so they were having um, Disney kind of pitch them on ideas. So that's why it kind of glorifies uh, South America and it makes you want to visit it. It's kind of like a travel diary because they visit different countries. Um, They talk about various cities. They talk about culture. Um, I mean, it's a little over the top. I think the thing you're thinking about is it's like Donald and the two guys. They're always like looking at the girls and it's kind of creepy. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean. Yeah, I yeah. remember that, yeah. When you're a kid, you don't really understand that kind of thing. It's like, oh, this guy just no. really likes the girls. But now it's like, comes off, I guess, yeah, it's creepy. Now that you think of it, it yeah. does kind of come off as predatory. Yeah, um, yeah uh, I mean, I, I have to come out and say it. I grew up in a Donald Duck household. My dad's a Donald Duck collector. He has a Donald Duck room. He's telling me right now that he's selling the, like, physical, like, tchotchkes and toys and stuff and keeping all the comics and art. Um, and I oh, guess I so believe he's him, but like, his collection? I, I don't know. And he, he tells me he listens to these, so maybe he'll, he'll hear me talking about him, but like, you know, he'll, he'll say, uh, he'll say he'll do something and it, it doesn't always happen. So we'll see. Um, I just told him, keep the stuff that's worth something so I can inherit it. But, um, no, I just, you know, I always would like to go in there and read the reprints that he has. He has a whole reprint library of all the Carl Bark stuff, all the um, Don Rosa, who was the successor. And what's interesting is Don Rosa is kind of like the, I guess you could say like the Ian Flynn of Donald, because he looks at the history and takes it all in and then presents it in a new way and puts his old own spin on it. Like one of the big things he did was Don Rosa had this uh, series called The Life and Times of Scrooge McDuck, where he would take all the like tidbits from old comics and made them into its own timeline. So you could read Uncle Scrooge from like birth all the way to like death, pretty much. Nice. <laughs> um, and it, and it was really good. It's really w- well worth a read. I don't know if you can find it online or something, but it's really a fantastic book. But yeah, I just, I always liked Donald. I kind of likened him to, 
maybe Sonic, just because I felt like even though Sonic's kind of like the Mickey Mouse of his brand, like he's the headliner, he's not like Mickey Mouse. He's not happy-go-lucky. He gets grumpy. Like, I like the Sonic OVA where he's really like, just like, come on, hurry up. You know, he'd get really upset with people. Uh, it reminded me of Donald a little bit, where Donald would just like be like, okay, great, yeah, okay, come on. You know, like he'd uh, have a short fuse. Um so I just, I don't know, I always liked the character. I always liked all the different iterations. Nothing I really dislike about him. The new stuff's pretty fun. I've been watching that. Um, so it's a little I violent. Got the, I got the picture of a little violent. Okay, uh-huh. you can tell me about that. But I was looking at the character and I was like, out of the evolution of Donald Duck, I would say like the first one doesn't look like him. Right when he got his first redesigned, it was like basically the look that we know but like the new one, right. don't you think it's also like a very huge dramatic change, just like the first? Absolutely. And how, how yeah, does somebody yeah. like your father that like collects for all these years, how does he feel about like a redesign like this? He's not a fan of it. He's not a fan of the new Mickey cartoons and he's not a fan of the new DuckTales. Like I think he really, I mean, I guess he gets it, but he just, it, I guess the equivalent would be like Sonic Boom with us, you know, like we'll talk mm-hmm. about it. We know about it, but we're not like. Oh man, I just binged Sonic Boom season one and two. What an awesome show! You know, we're more like, why did they do that? Why does why did this happen? What's going on? Yeah, um, you know. So I, it's interesting, it's the, but I just the I, show good. Which show? The new one, the, the new the Donald new one Duck. with the redesign with the baby Donald. I guess it looks like a baby. He does look like a baby. No, the new the new ones are good. They're these shorts by the guy who did, and people are going to kill me if I forget. I'm already forgetting. Man, what did he do? Shoot, I can't remember. Well, you can look it up. He's he's a well-known animator. The guy who voices Mickey, of all people, is like the guy who played Mo in the Three Stooges reboot movie. Really? And he played the boom mic the boom mic operator on The Office. Wow. <laughs> so, the guy that falls yeah, in love weird. with him? Yeah. Isn't that oh, weird? God. Yeah. He's like, hey, weird. hey, Mickey Mouse. But um Anyway, let, let's start talking about the game. I guess there's a game here to talk about. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so... Oh, wait, we're going to talk about Donald some more. Sorry, guys. Uh, Quackshot's interesting that because despite releasing just a year after DuckTales ended, but was still airing in reruns for you know years after that, and DuckTales, oh, yeah. the movie, had just released and was hitting home video, the game itself does not actually exist in the DuckTales universe. So instead... Quackshot exists more in the world of the Carl Barks comics with Uncle Scoo- Uncle Scrooge, Uncle Scrooge sporting his red shirt in cutscenes, and there's a greater emphasis on Donald, who was left out of DuckTales for, I believe, reasons um, that are kind of interesting. And there's lo- there's videos you can find on uh, channels like um, Defunct Land, which is really great, and Yesterworld, where they talk about this sort of stuff. But basically. Disney CEOs were like, let's make television animation, but you cannot use the big name characters. So they were like, oh, well, we want to do a Donald Duck adventure show. And they said, well, you can do it, but you can't put Donald Duck in it. You can have him in like the pilot episode. And then he goes off to the Navy and leaves his nephews. So it's like (laughs) Disney shooting themselves in the foot. They're like, let's make TV animation, but we can't use any of our main characters. Isn't that weird? That is Um, pretty weird. But I I mean... We say it's weird now, but I feel like DuckTales and, like, uh, Darkwing Duck are, like, pretty big staples of our childhood. So it's, like, would have been the same if they were allowed to do anything they wanted, like, Goofy and uh, Mickey and Donald Duck. Would they have been so creative with the characters? That's a good point. Like, because they were restricting themselves, they were able to, you know, find new ways to, you know, create new stories and not just lean on the classics. But... In this case, though, they they very much, you know, they had the nephews. They had a cameo from Pete in the game, who was the bad guy. Um, Pete was originally Mickey's nemesis, but uh, he was also a bad guy in Donald's first comic book, the Pirate Gold book. Um, Goofy is also in the game for some reason, though he never really had a history in the Donald Duck comics. Uh, Additionally, the game features globetrotting adventure elements, which were common in the early Donald and Scrooge comics. So... Um, do you think they should have leaned harder into like DuckTales canon? Um, or do you think it was a good decision to keep it tied to the classics? And also, do you think maybe it had to do with Capcom? Maybe it was a licensing issue? What do you think of that? 
it's so weird that they're like, hey, Capcom, you want to make a Donald Duck game? Good. And then, like, some, like, TV show is like, we want to make a Donald Duck TV show. No. So yeah. it's like, why? Why did Capcom <laughs> get to make a Donald Duck game? Anyway, um, I, I guess not really. Maybe me, I thought maybe that DuckTales and all the properties of DuckTales and stories are, like, tied with the writers and TV show. And maybe they have some sort of contract for merchandising and they don't want – and Capcom has to take a split maybe with the studio. So go maybe. for the old comics because, you know, it's cheaper maybe. Because, like, maybe, if you start yeah. using characters created by other people, I think it gets a little complicated. And at least Disney. I mean, I don't know. With Disney, they keep everything anyway, right? Yeah, like, they own everything. Yeah, if you go to Disneyland, they probably have DuckTales rides or merchandise at least. Right. Because Scrooge in the game only appears in one cutscene, like in the background. So I have to wonder if maybe this was having to do with Disney giving Sega the rights to Donald, but being like, you can't make a Scrooge game because we made a deal with Capcom. Um, Mm. Who knows? Um, I mean, I I think it was a smart decision to tie it to the classics because then even, you know, even though this isn't really like Castle of Illusion 2, it definitely keeps it tied more to that rather than making it like a DuckTales game starring Donald. Um and then, of course, being a globetrotting adventure, there is a story that we can discuss here. So let's dive into story. We've actually got two places that you can find the story. So first off is in the handy-dandy manual here. Um, and we'll bring that up on the screen. You can see Donald creeping through the temple. Yeah. A treasure hunt across the continents. While Uncle Scrooge naps, Donald Duck is flipping through some old books in the library. Whack! Out falls a strange piece of paper from one of the books. It's a long-lost message from King Garuzia, the old-time ruler of the Great Duck Kingdom. He's hidden his most prized possession somewhere on Earth, and he's left a map that leads to its whereabouts. I could be rich, richer than Uncle Scrooge, Donald thinks to himself, but Big Bad Pete and his ducky gang are lurking outside the window. Again, I think this is a way to get around DuckTales because it would have been the Beagle Boys, but they're calling them the ducky gang. Um, they're leaking out, <laughs> lurking outside the window. They're about to snatch the map, but Donald dashes away safe for the moment. Donald, you're late, Daisy scolds. But Daisy, something fabulous is waiting for me, Donald squawks. If I can't find it, I will be... Uh, if I can find it, it will be a terrific surprise for you. I'll tell you all about it when I get back. If he comes back, Donald has no idea what dangers surround the hunt for the great duck treasure. He only knows that he'll do anything to find it. Ooh, <laughs> what do you think of that? That's uh, <laughs> that's a pretty that's a story. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so he finds a treasure and he just decides to go, like, and just go blatantly to uh, like go find it that's it he he finds the directions i guess to a map and then off he goes yeah pretty much i guess um, he is like sonic the hedgehog huh <laughs> yeah he is uh so next let's check out how the story kicks off in the game it's i mean it doesn't really differ from the manual all that much but it gives you a better idea with the pictures there's some different lines of dialogue so uh, you got the, the video playing i do this comes from long plays dot org the world of long plays i'll start um, it i'm gonna start you can probably hear it i'm gonna start off like at 45 50 seconds in uh yeah with the little yeah and i don't need to well i guess i would need to read it right it started you hear it yeah so it says according to the book garuzia was once the leader of a great duck kingdom just before he died king garuzia hid his most prized possession in a secret location. And there's Uncle Scrooge sleeping. Tucked inside the book, Donald found a map showing the clues to where the treasure could be found. (laughs) Wow, Donald exclaimed, if I could find a treasure like this, I'd be richer than Uncle Scrooge. There's Pete looking at him. With me binoculars but one of pete's gang had been spying through the window and saw everything donald took the map with him as he started to head home pete's gang chased after donald in the treasure map donald could see an open manhole cover and jumped over it but pete's gang all fell in (laughs) <laughs> Donald took Huey, Dewey, and Louie to the plane to take off at the for the great treasure hunt. 
But just then, Daisy appeared. Donald, where are you going? You were supposed to be at my house for dinner an hour ago. Wow. Always nagging, dude. I know, right? Daisy, something very important has come up. I'm going to find something special for you, and I want it to be a surprise. That's it? He just tells her I'm just take off by. Yeah, that's it. And then she goes, Donald, wait, come back, Donald. And that's it. Um, and you can... Oh, yeah, Donald and his nephews took off in their plane, leaving a furious Daisy behind. And then Pete's like... You know, and then we Pete's have like gang a, flew after them. Yeah, we have like an open and, world map. Whoa, look at that! Yeah, map, and it's pretty sweet. So you can keep the video playing if you want. Uh, maybe just turn down the volume as we continue on. Um, so yeah, so you know, it's it's kind of a classic setup for an adventure story. Nothing too exciting to discuss here, um, but really, you know, it's just telling you that you're going to be jumping around the globe looking for clues to find the treasure. Um, you know, I, I have no complaints. I think though, in terms of gameplay, that's where the game really stands out. Uh, Quackshot has a lot more fast pace than Castle of Illusion. And it makes sense given how the games, how much the games had grown on the Genesis and Mega Drive between 1990 and 1991. Sonic had just seen his debut in June 91 and Quackshot had to keep up with Sonic and what new adopters to the platform were expecting of the machine. Like, could you imagine someone gets the, the Sonic Genesis bundle and then like a game like Castle of Illusion comes out in 1991, like following Sonic? Yeah. I mean, not, you know, not to say anything bad about Castle of Illusion, but it's a slow game. Yeah, um, compared to Sonic for sure. Yeah, yeah. And so there are some things in this game that speeds it up. There's a dash button. I think Castle of Illusion has a dash button too, but here it's it's got a little more to it. You can actually uh, do belly slides on the ground which is kind of fun and then there is a like super move that we will get to it's not chaos emeralds but it's still kind of cool um so what players do is they can walk dash and jump just as they did in castle of illusion and like mickey donald does come equipped with a a weapon though it's a lot more exciting i think but the comparisons kind of end there donald doesn't jump on enemies heads he doesn't throw marbles um but instead a genius plunger gun weapon system is employed. And I was I was going to hold up a plunger, but then I realized it's the one we use for our toilet, and that would be completely oh. disgusting. <laughs> but it looks it looks like the Donald Duck plunger. It's like a short little cartoon plunger. It looks exactly like the one in his gun on the cover of the game. Um, <laughs> How does it work, uh, though, for, like, its usage? Pretty good, right? I mean, look at it. I mean, he's kicking ass in this game. Absolutely. It's weird, though. So basically, it's like a pistol with a plunger coming out, and it's a nonstop plunger gun. I don't know where they come from. I'm not going to question it. It even has the, like, bullet chamber, which makes even less sense. Um, But hey, it's a cartoon. Uh, (laughs) The game begins with Donald having a yellow plunger gun. This gun will stun enemies and does little else, but it does have unlimited ammo, which means you can spam it as much as you want. Um, if you want to take enemies out, the popcorn gun is the best bet. Um, but this has limited ammo, which you must collect by picking up corn power-ups. Playing through the story gets you the red plunger, given to you by Goofy of all characters, which really changes the game up. Red plungers, they stick to walls momentarily, so you can jump up on the... Uh, plunger? On the, um, the plunger, wood? yeah. it's yeah. All, it's The best way to describe it, if you haven't played the game, is Sonic 2 with the um, uh, boss that shoots arrows, and then when the arrows stick into the wall, Sonic can jump on them. But imagine having a weapon that does that. It's pretty cool. Um, Yeah. Changes everything. Donald, yeah, so you can reach high places by shooting and then jumping and going up at like a ladder. Green is the next power-up of the plunger gun. I'll be honest, I never found the green one to be that exciting. You're like, oh, what does this one do? And all it really does is it allows you to ride on certain enemies and things by holding onto the handle Mm. from below. I mean, it's cool and all, but it's not something you can spam so much like the the red one. And then lastly, there is a bubblegum shooter, which shoots a bubble that breaks down certain barriers. Again, not the most exciting one, but it is very helpful. Um, Items include a, a power gauge 
replenishing food, one-ups, money bags, which offer bonus points, and then finally chili peppers. And collecting five chili peppers builds up Donald's temper gauge to unleash a quack attack, uh, where Donald runs really fast and destroys most enemies in his path for a limited time. And I think the most memorable thing about the quack attack is when Donald gets it, he goes, <laughs> and it's like the most non-Donald sounding thing, but it still sounds like a duck just like going mental. Um, and I, I think that kind of brings a sonic element to it just because you're like, oh, wow, he's so fast. I can't control him. Wow. Um, one cool th- aspect to quack <laughs> shot. Too, I is think that in the, it's, in the uh, beginning mm-hmm. of the of this play, the playthrough, the first one, he does it right away, and it looks really funny. It looks like he's like, yeah, I don't know, like I'll, I'll play it right now for people that are watching it, but it looks like he's just like screaming and running, like he's like tripping or something, kind of. <laughs> yeah, it's basically Donald just having a sp- spazzing out. It's great. Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> and what I what I love about my personal favorite uh, aspect of the game is that it's non-linear. Players will play stages to a point where they can't progress until they later obtain a weapon that they can return to the stage and explore new areas. This sort of concept is nothing new, but in 1991, I think it was quite new. And it was a fun innovation to the platforming genre. And um, so, yeah, what do you think about that weapon system? Um, And what other games do you think you can kind of compare that weapon system to? I, I guess people would now say it's like Castlevania or Metroidvania. Is that, I guess, mm-hmm. in a way, like light? Um, yeah. I would say something like maybe uh, Wonder Boy 3, I guess, some people would, would say. But it wasn't as, like, I guess, I don't know what to say. Like, there's so many weapons and stuff they put and how much limitations they put. I feel like this one, did you think it had as many limitations or was it more linear? With some backtracking where you found new areas with new weapons. Or, like, I don't um, know, Mega Man maybe? I don't know. Because, like, Mega Man also has some weapons sometimes that give you abilities to get to new areas randomly to get, like, E-Tanks or something. You know, you know, that's a good point because I did throw this question out to Twitter. I was asking people if if they could think of games that had this, like the earliest one they could think of. People threw Metroid out there. But remind remind me, because I'm not a big Metroid fan, um, I, is that so. one big stage? The game is one big stage, right? Uh, I've played Super Metroid only, and yes, it's it's like you, it's kind of like Castlevania Symphony of, Symphony of the Night, where you go, you unlock little corridors, and then you stop there. And but it's supposed to be one big map. It's at least in theory. Okay, yes. okay. So and yeah, and of course, you could also say that point point and click adventures have been doing things like this for years, where you can walk around and, you know, go to other rooms. But I think in terms of like platformers where the stages are completely disconnected, only accessible from an overworld map, typically like in Mega Man, wouldn't it be like you jump to the beginning of the stage each time? Pretty much. Yeah. So like if you, yeah. So if you beat a boss, you get a new move, you go to another stage, you get that it's like a rock, paper, scissors, obviously, with the moves. Right, right. So you, right. you do it in order, but sometimes if you come back, there'll be like a certain spot where you'll get like a double jump later and then you could, you know, uh, or you'll find a new area underwater where you when you can breathe more. And then you'll okay. unlock little items that make the game easier. It's not needed, though. It's not like something, like you'll unlock like a extra power up for your gun or something or a, a right, tank, which right. lets you refill your life. Yeah. Okay, so I think Quackshot was kind of unique and maybe maybe not so much a pioneer but definitely doing something different here just because there were very clear stages like Duckburg, Transylvania. I mean, we'll go through all of them, but um you would play it up to a point and then you would plant a flag and you would never have to go back and replay that stage to get That's to where cool. you needed to be. Yeah, so it, it was almost kind of like imagine a Sonic game where Sonic Act one and act two are in one stage, but when you get to the end of act one, you leave, you go into the next stage, play that act one, and then jump back to the end of act one for the first stage and play act two. So, yeah, I I think that's kind of pioneering because it's almost, it saves your space. It's a very forgiving game in that sense. And there are some cool bits that happen later on where you do backtrack 
but it changed the way you go through the stage backwards is like a totally different experience because you received the weapon that changes the way you go through. So you're not only backtracking, but you now have this weapon. You're like, oh, let's try this out. Oh, I can climb this this uh, this wall that was there before that didn't make sense to me. So there are some really cool things going on there. Um, again, if you want to sound off in the comments below, correct us or point out anything that did that. But I don't know. I feel like it might be one of the first games to do that. Um, I did want to throw a weird side note in here. Um, I know you're excited for this and we can watch a different <laughs> video, but, um, uh, the Disney Channel, it, uh, Uh-oh, it did. We're get st- flagged. You excited, right? Yeah, we're going to get yeah. flagged. Uh, the Disney Channel started running a show called Donald Duck's Quack Attack in 1992, which played old Donald shorts. And between the segments, they would show clips with a gauge showing Donald's temper growing until it reached Uh-oh. the top and he, got so mad that he had a quack attack. And I bring this up because in the game and even on the back of the box, he it, has a quack it attack. Refers, yeah. It refers to the quack attack, which is the peppers and it's a gauge. So if we want to just, um, just for fun, throw this video on there. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play it. 46 seconds. Yeah. It's only, yeah. Quack attack. Look at that. <laughs> See, his quack meter's going up. He's getting mad. All these terrible things happening to Donald, and he's just losing it. Wow. That is so 90s. When was this? 90s, right? 92. 92, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe the past. So I, who knows? <laughs> it could have. It could have inspired it. Uh, could have. <laughs> could have. Um, but anyway, as mentioned, Quackshot. It is non-linear, meaning you begin the game with more than one stage to start at. Um, if you listen to our Ghostbusters show, that one was similar because you could go to any of the four houses. The problem is. Is that while you could complete like the later houses, it really helped to have the just the money um, and the experience to get through that. So I think what really works in uh, Quackshot's favor is that it uses a similar approach. However, you can make it through like the first act of any of the first stages. It's just a matter of when you get to the end you might be told something where you're like, oh, I should jump back to Duckburg or, oh, I should go to Transylvania. So it still works out of sequence, but there is kind of a right way to play through it just so that you're not playing three stages in a row where people go, oh, you need to go here. Oh, you mm. need to go here. You know, <laughs> you know um, I think yeah. I know a game that is kind of like this Capcom's. <laughs> it's also Capcom, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Demon Crest. Is it Capcom that okay. made that game? You you're like a demon and you could fly. Uh, it has like one of those like weird like um, I don't know how you would say it. I don't know what other games used it, but you're flying and it has that weird like what's it called F nine mode or whatever on the Super Nintendo that all games had where it kind of was like three D right. but not. And then you could mm-hmm. fly and then go to different towns and then unlock things and you're like you play as a demon. Um, oh, that's cool. Maybe, but I don't. You don't plant a flag though. I don't think so. So maybe no. No, I don't. So that's you where know, the, no where flag this game's planting. different. Sorry, exactly, yes. and you play as a demon, <laughs> but I mean Donald is kind of a demon, so exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, I'll just give an example if people aren't really following how the game plays. Uh, Donald will start off in Duckburg. He'll make his way through the city until he hits a wall. An NPC tells him he needs the equipment to climb. Donald flies to Mexico, makes his way through a desert where a woman tells him he needs a key to enter the temple. So he flies back to Duckburg. He obtains the key from the first NPC, then returns to the temple in Mexico, goes through the temple, meets Goofy at the end, who gives him the red plunger. Donald backtracks through the temple with the new weapon, which makes it easier to progress through. And then he goes to Duckburg, scales the wall, makes his way through the city rooftops, finds Gyro Girlos, who gives him a bubblegum gun, which will help him enter the castle in Transylvania. So, I mean... You know, there are, it's like a fet, bunch of fetch quests, but they keep the story going. Um, 
You're always building up your like, inventory too. Yeah, it feels like it. It feels like an early Yakuza game. So you're like going to the city. <laughs> you're going over here doing the side quest to get more power up to do this. Yeah, and then you backtrack again. And you know, it's like they could make one in the Yakuza engine. Like a Donald Duck where he wobble. Can you imagine Donald Duck and uh, Kamarocho wobbling around with his little butt? I want to see fan art of uh, Donald Kiro, Kazuma Duck, where it's like... um, (laughs) He's got the little goatee thing and uh, the masculine body. I'd love that. That would be awesome. (laughs) Um, It would be nice. And, you know, of course, growing up on Sonic... It always kind of crossed my mind, like, I'd like to see a Sonic game like this. And I guess Sonic Adventure is kind of like that. But I think it would be kind of cool to see a non-linear 2D Sonic game that kind of uses this sort of idea where, like, let's say you play Green Hill Zone Act 1, and then they're like, oh, you got to go to Chemical Plant. So you go to Chemical Plant, and then they're like, oh, great job, Sonic. You just found the key that will get you into the aquatic ruins, you know, and so it would be kind of cool to... Have a non-linear Sonic game. I think that would be fun, like overworld map, like Sonic Unleashed 2D. Um yeah. might be fun. So let's let's go through here now and take a place, take a look at some of the places that Sonic Sonic Donald visits on his adventure. I did group them together, however, this is not the order that the game goes. So for example, you're gonna be seeing two Duckburg screens, but that's not the the as you can see, you'd play Mexico in between one and two. So this is not spoiling anything in terms of the game's progression, really. Um, but it is giving you an idea of what each of the locations look like. So first up, we have Duckburg. And I'm actually reading from the manual here. It says, A town full of trouble keeps Donald zigzagging through danger. Towering skyscrapers lead to sizzling power lines and an important discovery. Ooh. Um, hot take and of course uh, this is yeah. Pittsburgh this is literally Pittsburgh <laughs> Pittsburgh <laughs> yeah it does look like Pittsburgh um, you know this is this is where Uncle Scrooge's money bin is uh, I don't know if there's any references to that in the background would have been cool but I think there is a Mickey Mouse like hot air balloon or something which is kind of funny um, you know it's it's a de- it's a good first stage it's a good way to get your bearings um, the enemies are I don't really talk about them here in the notes, but they're interesting. Like they look like little peats. They yeah. definitely are not Beagle Boys, though. They are like I always found it strange to call them like the Ducky Gang, even though they're they're clearly like Pete, who is like a dog. I don't know why. Um, the weirdest ones, and maybe you saw it in our playthrough footage earlier, was um, the turtles. The turtles with boxing gloves, who were actually based on an old silly symphony short. Of the tortoise and the hare. So it's oh, like yeah. they took like a, ni- a 1930s turtle design and repurposed it for an enemy, which is kind of funny. Um, next up, let's fly to Mexico. So Mexico has exploding cacti, burbling quicksand, scorpions, buzzards, and bees. Oh my. Find the sweet senorita and the entrance to a secret place. Ooh la la. Um, so I can see... You you've been to Mexico. Does it look like this? <laughs> Not where my family's from. Definitely doesn't look like this. I mean, there's a lot of cactus, and the I mean, in Mexico, people eat cactus, and they all have different names. You know, like they over here, everything that is green and looks like that is cactus. Over there, they like have a gazillion names for it, and they enjoy eating it. I I like it. It's not terrible, but it definitely isn't my favorite food. Um, uh, and I, I've never been into the, uh, the temples, but I'm assuming okay. it looks exactly like that. I'm sure I, uh, it does. It looks like it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think Disney would lie to us at all. <laughs> no, never. Uh, now this one's interesting. So let's see. They actually have them out of order in the manual. Um, they even call things the wrong names in the manual here, but, uh, Transylvania. So this is a, it starts off with a creepy forest and a cold mist, which gives Donald the shivers. I really Vampire like bats, stage. pudgy ghosts, and bowling skeletons rattle Donald's spirit. He'll receive a blood-chilling welcome from his host, the evil Count. Yeah, so what do you think of this one? I like it. I think they did a really good job with the forest and stuff, the way it looks. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Iconic. It's scary and creepy. And if you were a kid, you probably 
probably creeped you out a little bit, even if you didn't want to admit it. Yeah. It's definitely the most Castle of Illusion looking stage, too, I yeah. would say, in terms of design. I mean, that game kicked off in a happy forest, and here we have, like, evil trees with faces, um, yeah. fat ghosts, and uh, skeletons in their coffins, which is kind of fun. Um, and then um, there's your first boss. So you hit this guy, and if you listen to our D episodes, here we have Dracula, and Ooh. he is unleashing bats from his cloak. And it's, you know, it, the, the bosses in this game are nothing too crazy over the top like you're not going to get a treasure style game it's just kind of like he flies around and goes and then like the the bats come out um still it's a it's a cool design it's a shame though they couldn't call him count duckula because that name has already been taken oh really Um, yeah yeah count duckula was a tv show I, i don't know where it came from i could be wrong i thought it had like I thought it was from Mexico, but maybe I'm wrong. But it, oh it's a God. fun. You know what? You're right. It is a thing. And they sell the complete series on somewhere online. Look at this thing. I'll tell you. I went to a comic book shop. They had the complete like 12 or 25 issue comic book series, and it was in the bargain bin. And I was like, "Oh, are these a dollar each?" And the guy sees that I wanted to buy the whole set, and he goes, "Oh, no, they're five dollars each." And I'm like, "Well, I'm not buying the whole thing then." And he's like trying to trick me. <laughs> uh, it's just shame. It looked cool. Um, Moving on, we have the Maharaja. And what I find so weird about Maharaja is it's out of order in the manual. It's way in the back. Um, All they really say about Maharaja, which is actually the Maharaja's palace. Okay. So it's it's not a location. It's like named after the guy who runs the place, which is kind of weird. Um Sneaky snake charmers do their best to stop Donald in his tracks, a giant labyrinth. Can't, could be the deep dark end. So they don't really have much to say about that. But you can see these no. guys here. Looks like Aladdin, right? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's like they should have done a Aladdin crossover. <laughs> exactly. Um, and you can see the Maharaja there. You get a little cutscene. If you can defeat the tiger in the garden, I'll reward you with this Sphinx tear. Um, so wow. that's, that's kind of cool. But and- like, again, you know. Donald Duck, the game. Donald Duck fighting uh-huh. a, a tiger as a boss, and Kazuma Kiryu fighting a tiger as a boss. Crossover mm-hmm. here, I don't know, man. Yeah, so Same let's character. let's talk about this tiger. This tiger, he he looks, he has the head of Shere Khan from the Jungle Book, yeah, and from yeah. Uh, Tailspin, and it's just bizarre, isn't it? He's like, like he's like a he, chunk, he's chubby. chunk. Yeah, he's a chunk. Chunked version yeah, of him. Chungus. Chunk boy. Yeah, he's a Chungus, Chungus Khan. Tiger. <laughs> Somebody overfed this guy too much, dude. I know, right? And he breathes how- fire, too, which is just bizarre. <laughs> Look how um, happy he looks in the picture, though. He's just, like, I know. enjoying well, he, that's the f- he He smiles and, like, leaps around, but then he breathes fire at you. It's it's a really bizarre enemy. Um, <laughs> that's scary, dude. <laughs> Next, let's let's fly to Egypt. So Egypt, the pyramid is chock full of traps, pitfalls, and secret chambers. Donald's up against a dead end until he can solve the riddle of the Sphinx. Ooh. Um, so as you can see here, Egypt is uh, it's got a lot going on. It has there's those turtles I was talking about. It's got the outdoor, the indoor temple, and it even has a strange minecart. Sonic would be proud, I think. Oh um, yeah, Sega of America is like, wow, that's we maybe maybe we need to bring this back on iPhone. <laughs> Absolutely. And something I didn't bring up too here is look at that power gauge. Like it's not one hit kills. It's a very forgiving game in that sense. I don't even think Castle of Illusion. I think they only have like three I, I can't recall, but definitely not what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh little power pellets. So Again, it's it's not an insanely difficult game, which is great because you can actually play play through it without too much uh, effort. Um, what I find interesting, though, with this next boss, it's not really a boss. It's called Riddle. So if you're looking at this, you see on the floor there are four symbols. And early on in the game, you receive a piece of paper that just tells you I'm not. I forgot what the exact order is, but it would be like sun, moon, star, cloud, or something like that. And you're like, "What the hell does this mean?" And then when you get into this chamber, you cannot 
progress. And I think you might die if from a, a crushing wall from above um, if you don't step on the four symbols in the order that the uh, the note you found tells you to. So it's kind of the first first and last case of like a puzzle in the game, but it's still kind of fun. Like it gives you an Indiana Jones moment um, where you really had to pay attention to something you learned early on and you carry it with you so you can read your uh, inventory. So it's not like they're tricking you that much, but what do you, what do you think of that? Throwing a puzzle in this at is the, the very kind middle. Of, this is the kind of things that when I was a kid, I would pr- never figure out because I'm such, I'm like, and then, you know, you, you I mean, because I used to play this one, obviously, with my other family members. And they're like, well, I'll take it off and put another game on. Anytime you would get to any stuck part, they're like, we could just play Streets of Rage 2 or uh, any other game, right? Right, right. So the, this is, but if obviously, if I had it in my, my house and I figured this out, I feel like I'm the most brilliant person in the room. Oh, yeah, I figured it out. No big deal. <laughs> yeah. But that's, I mean, that's the thing is like they could make it easier, but that's kind of fun to have a little thing thrown in there where you can really feel smart and be like, oh, wait, those symbols. I remember that that piece of paper I got. Let me read this. And then the thing is, is you can you can pause at this point. You can read the paper and then it'll tell you the order. It's not like, oh, shit. You know, like <laughs> what did Gyro tell me or whatever, like an hour ago? Um, it's kind of like uh, yeah. when um, it's kind of like the early version of something like Metal Gear Solid where they're like, hey, uh, you got to call this girl on codec and they're like, it's on the CD case and then you look at on the actual CD case and it's right there on the back of the CD case. <laughs> or like right in front of your face and it gives you that moment of like, wow, I figured something out outside of like a typical game mechanic, you know? Like it's, yeah. at this point there wasn't very much hey, we gave you a note, go check your note real quick, I guess. Like I, I've never seen that many platformers use that. I know, I think Roger Rabbit did that where you could call a 1-800 number mm. and it was in the game, but it, it clearly was not, uh, did not stick around for long. Um, let's fly to the South Pole next. Oh, I closed my little book. I was so excited to talk about whatever we were talking about here. Uh, South Pole. So we- what a workout dashing across rising and falling ice flows. Breathless Donald is a m- bombarded by snow foes. Snow foe. <laughs> Um, a key to his dilemma could turn up under the ice. Ooh. So I, I think at this point, the game's kind of losing steam in terms of creativity just because South Pole looks really cool. But if you go and look at those early uh, uh, Mexico, it looks very similar. Like it's, I, I you can't really see it in the screenshots that I had, but in the Mexico stage, it also has an outdoor area with going up and down and parrots and, and, uh, you know, pitfalls. Mm. But the difference is you have the green um, plunger, which you can stick to the birds and, and, you know, hold on to them. So, you know, little, little variety there. But I think what's really cool is once you get into the Viking ship, um, wow, the Viking ghost ship, it's got women popping out of barrels with, um, uh, arrows and it says ship ahoy blasting cannons shiver the timbers of this spook ridden spook ridden vessel in the eerie moonlit night donald finds something he desperately needs i don't think it's those ladies they're pretty crazy um they have like beards dude yeah they kind of do maybe they're women maybe they're men i don't know um i don't see gender but when we get to the inside of the ship I think this is really cool. So suddenly the whole screen's like red, like from fire. And it's got this really cool, like Viking ghost and the skeleton ghost. He has a giant hammer. The thing looks and terrifying. He falls, yeah. He falls apart too. And his head lands on the floor. So, I mean, as evidence, there's only, this is only like the third boss, probably the most creepiest. If you, you know, the, the tiger was kind of happy and, Dracula was pretty welcoming. Um, yeah. I mean, he was like so, a duck. Yeah. So, I, you know, uh, I haven't made it this far in the game too often. I think I've only completed the game maybe a handful of times. But this is definitely a standout when you get to this cool inside uh, red lit part of the ship. And you get this creepy guy throwing stuff at you. Um, but next up, things start to really heat up. So you come to Pete's hideout. 
And what does it have to say about Pete's hideout in here? I don't know. Oh, the Ducky Gang hideout. Big Bad Pete and his cohorts are full of surprises. The explosive kind. Donald gets trapped in a boggling maze with only one way out. So as you can see here, there's lots of gimmicks. There's even kind of sonic uh, gimmicks here with the um, floating like propeller things that... Um, the platforms and they actually move in a pattern so they kind of fan out and then come together which is very sonic the hedgehog one um and if the sonic comparisons they don't end there because when you um get to pete so let's check out pete here is this the one where he has the suit on yeah yeah he's in like basically an egomatic with a he crusher has, he has the same hat you do but yours is green oh yeah put it on dude put it back on <laughs> yeah i mean here we go same hat. Here we go. <laughs> Same yeah, guy. Yeah. <laughs> and Pete here, and I, I didn't mention it uh, earlier, but he really is kind of going for the Donovan role. If you've seen uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the main bad guy, he's you know he's got like the hat and the suit, oh, um, yeah. and he's trailing Indiana Jones and kind of picking up on his trail and stealing a lot of the. Uh, the discoveries that Indy found. So yeah, Pete, he's, uh, he's not that tricky actually like Eggman. It's just kind of like avoid the crusher hit him and he's defeated. So that's what brings you to the great duck treasure Island. Ooh. So as you can see here, this is a pretty exciting looking Island with some temples. It's got some creepy, like, duck architecture like manly ducks holding up pillars and um <laughs> oh yeah i see in the back yeah you see that and then it's yeah. got like these stone guys that you fight and then the final boss of the game is actually the guardian of the duck treasure which again <laughs> 1989 indiana jones and the last crusade comes out this game comes out in 1991 both of those games had a knight with a sword protecting a treasure, not tr not really a bad guy, more just like a guardian who would fight anyone coming to take the treasure. And um, and I, I won't spoil the end. I think we'll play the end credits over the end of the show. So you can see yeah. how things turned out for Donald. But overall, that's the adventure. So what do you think of, um, I mean, again, this is not linear. You jump no. around from these different places. But can you imagine playing a game where you get little samplings of all of these things as you go through um, hitting that map screen um, I mean, I, I personally think it's a pretty exciting game. There's very few weak points. I think maybe the South Pole is kind of not that exciting to me. But what do you think? I'd like to hear your thoughts. I think it has a lot of variations. I think, like you said, it was like it had some things where, like, the snow one, the South Pole, maybe pull out some more things that would make it more South Pole. I feel like... uh I think a lot of these kind of like adventure travel slash Sonic the Hedgehog games all kind of had the whole like, how many times have we played a snow level or how many times have we played right. in like uh, the desert? So the South America one maybe should have been in a different like place, like maybe like Rome or like another actual location, kind of like Mexico. Because I think Mexico right. gives it its own vibe with the cactuses and stuff. And then Egypt has the pyramids uh maybe they should have went somewhere that other games don't but i guess it's like these this team probably did it like in nine months so right besides that it, there's a lot of uh, variety there's a lot of different things there's forests there's these weird like mechanical mm -hmm. places the mechanical stuff reminds me of like uh shinobi 3 i don't know why you know mm -hmm. there's like all those levels with the platforms that move around like that and machinery um but overall, pretty cool adventure. Uh, what's your opinion on... I mean, you obviously like the game, but is there anything yeah, that yeah. you change levels-wise? Well, I think what's interesting is that because it's an adventure game, there's so many temples. And I think they actually do a really great job making each temple feel unique. I'm trying to think of some other games like Tomb Raider. Obviously, you go to tons of different temples. Um, Breath of the Zelda, Breath of the Wild, where there are a lot of different like temples. I felt those looked a little too samey. Um, whereas like a game like man, what's another? Oh, uh, uh, Jedi Fallen Order. There's a ton of uh, temples in that game. They all feel very unique. So I think it's cool here that 
even though, like you said, you know, like you get your snow level, you get your uh, Egypt level, they do do a good job of letting you check out different temples. And there's all these different gimmicks, like the mine cart, the spears, the crushing walls. Um, I didn't, you can't really see it here in any of the screenshots, but like um, there was one stage where you were kind of stationary trying to make yourself forward, but the walls kept moving towards you and you'd have to use the red plunger to climb quickly and progress through the stage or you kept get it kept pushing you back. So it was almost like those auto scrolling Mario stages, but in reverse where mm. you're stationary and the stage is moving and you need to make your way through it. So there's a lot of cool little, little bits like that. There's like I said, traps. Um, there's ones where you're kind of making your way through trying to, get away from a fireball. So it's not all straight up platforming and it's not all boss fights. And I think that's a good thing because it's not like, you know, Oh, I played two stages. Here comes the boss. Instead. It's like, Oh, I played two stages and now I'm going to solve a puzzle or now I'm going to get stuck in a trap. So there's a lot of variety there. And I think what helps it is the music and sound effects. Um, so let's talk about that Quack Shot's memorable soundtrack. It's credited to Kamiya Studio. Um, and the sound, I assume, which are the sound effects, were by Bo. <laughs> and so uh, Bo is an alias for Takuhiko Uwabo. It's almost like Uwu, but it's Uwabo. Um, Uwabo. He is one of Sega's older sound members with his credits including music from the first two Fantasy Star games. So this guy already has, like, you know, all yeah. my respect in the world. Um, several Master System arrangements of classic arcade tunes. So he did uh, Space Harrier and Space Harrier 3D for the um, Master System. So, of course, he didn't write the music, but he arranged it for those platforms. And, of mm. course, he did the Castle of Illusion releases for Mega Drive and Master System. So he was carrying over there. Um, so having said that, I don't think he did the music for the game. I think he just did the sound effects, but still there's a lot of iconic sounds here. There's the, uh, aforementioned, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> uh, there's the plunger sound effects, which are like, Poof. I can't do it. And then it's like sploink. And then it's like ding, ding, ding. So it's like all these crazy cartoony kind of sounds. I think that he just nailed, um, as far as the music, I might be getting this wrong. I might be talking about a completely different guy. However, Sega Retro says that Kamiya Studio is a guy named Shigenori Kamiya. And I found very little, very, very, very little information about this guy. I don't know if they're still alive even. There's a website called rabbitears.rip, which I thought originally was his website. But I think it's a fan Mm. site devoted to chronicling his work. None of the Quackshot games or Sega games are mentioned on this website. However, they do say that he worked in advertising, like he did ad music, which might be a, might be like a catch-all term, and they might consider this ad music because it's more like not true music. It's not like he went out and go, oh, I'm going to make Quackshot the album. You know, it's more like it's a gig. You make the music. Um, oh, he yeah. is supposed to be... So he was a race car driver who was injured and became a synth master who turned to music. Yeah, and he focused on ad music, as mentioned, and jazz. Um, I actually, while I was working today, I actually played one of his soundtracks. It's really good stuff. Um, The two albums I saw, I believe, released, though, in 1980. So I have to imagine that maybe this was towards the end of his career, if he is still around. Um because this would, of course, be a decade later. But if you ever want to check this stuff out, and I'll, we'll play a little sample of it after we click through some of these uh, Quackshot songs. But there, I, I mean, maybe I was stretching, but I'd listen to some of the music. I'm like, oh, this is kind of like the temple kind of music, where it's it's very um, synth wave. You know what I mean? Mm, like, yeah. um, it's, it's well worth checking out, though, uh, both albums from the guy. But let's just, let's take a, maybe a, 15, 20 second listen to the duck, Duckburg music we got here. Got you. Let me put it up. It's like the old timey music, right? Yeah. Listen, keep going. 
Oh, this part? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got... Yo, some grandma's gonna be just this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and what I really like about that track, not only is it a really funny, like, first track, but it does sound like a duck waddling, doesn't it? Like, wah, 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 Oh, yeah, it definitely does. <laughs> um, I, again, I... I don't know if this is the same guy, but just listening to some of his music, there is kind of like a jazzy, old-timey kind of feel to that that I think they might be throwing down. Um, it's catchy, though. It's fun. Uh, I like it, but we should get into Transylvania. This is a completely different song here. All yeah. right. Uh, let me get it up. Sorry about that. Uh <laughs> It has real creepy vibes. Yeah, very echoey. It kind of sounds out of the Ghostbusters game. Definitely. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, it's a good one. And then this last one, this is one I haven't heard too often because it's at the end of the game. But people in the comments were like, oh, this is the best best track in the whole game. So I thought we'd check it out. This is Island. Let me play uh Oh, the island one? Really? The, uh, yeah. Gotta bump it up if it's that good. <laughs> you know that, uh... You know that image of the of the guy that's looking all tough and stuff and he has the iPods and it's like my headphones? This is <laughs> This is what's playing in my headphones when I'm looking tough. <laughs> this is like the weirdest one I think out of them. The ones you other ones you, yeah. you send me are more like um I would say like simple, uh rhythmic, and this one's like wah, wah, wah. it has like these weird sound effects that he added in. For sure. And this is kind of the one I can see people jabbing. This, this is kind of the one that I think lends credence to this guy I was talking about, uh, Shigenori Kamiya, mm. being the guy I was thinking it was. Because when I listened to some of his tracks, there was one that was real catchy and fun, and then all of a sudden it was like people screaming, like going ah, and I was like, whoa, what the, you know? So He's let's let's check huh? out. Yeah, right. So let's check out his album here. So this is the complete album. They're both hosted um on this rabbit ears channel but this one is called pharaoh's tomb it has like an anime cover yeah Look at that cover right there guys if you're not watching it you could explain to people that are like just listening to it yeah yeah it's it's very much an old cd cover um it's what got a woman one? with a bird uh apparently 1980 Wow. I could be wrong because it's like a CD, so maybe it released a little later. But it's just kind of relaxing. You play it anywhere inside? Jazzy. It? Kind of relaxing, jazzy music. So, you know, I, I have no idea. Oh, I just played it, sorry. For oh, the yeah, background. that's good. So you can talk about it while it's playing. Yeah, yeah. So what. I mean, it's not like you're going to be. It doesn't scream quack shot. But I have to imagine this is the same person. I just think it's really interesting that they have not had any other video game work outside of some Disney titles, which maybe they just never really cared about. They were like, oh, that's that's ad work, you know? <laughs> so yeah, who knows? It's a paycheck. Um, I mean, my friend Steve told me that he about how one of the Mega Man uh, composers was just like a nobody. He was just a salary man, did his job, and then when he learned years later that people loved his music, he was like, really? That was just a job. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I think there's a lot of those people in Japan in the industry where they wanted to be musicians themselves and they didn't really make it their album and then they, oh, whatever work comes in, it's a paycheck, and they just took it and they... 
created these like legendary soundtracks that people revere and they're like oh my god i grew up with this and you like inspired me to go in the industry and they're like oh okay <laughs> it's like okay right exactly so you can check these out for yourself they're actually some great background music it's not so much uh uh it, it's called synthwave right like it's not so much that but it's definitely relaxing jazzy synth music so i enjoy it check it out um i think he should have done more game music it's kind of a shame that this person's so obscure that we don't even know if we're talking about the right guy. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, but that's kind of the story of video games. Thankfully, we do have some people who uh, who did make it. But before we get into that, I think this is really cool here. So Disney, obviously, it was no stranger to licensed games in the late 80s and early 90s with previously established deals at Capcom proving that Disney games could make big money and see critical acclaim with hits like DuckTales and Chippendale Rescue Rangers. So Sega, upon seeing this, secured the rights to Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. We discussed Castle of Illusion in Sega Talk number 26 way back, I think, in like 2019. Um, and you can revisit that if you want more info on that game. Quackshot, meanwhile, fulfilled the Donald portion of the deal, and having seen the quality of the game, Disney was so impressed that they gave Sega first right of refusal on game development plans for new and existing licenses, thus explaining why Sega consoles were the home to so many great Disney games in the 90s. So, um, what are your opinions on Disney's releases on the Sega Genesis, and you think Disney made the right choice going with Sega? They, they, I mean, when I was growing up, it always felt like Sega did the the Sega portion, and then Capcom did the Super Nintendo portion of them. So I always mm -hmm. felt like the Sega games, even if some people would would say, "Oh, Aladdin on the Super Nintendo is way better," I think animation in an animation standpoint, Sega took extra care, and it really did show compared to Capcom. And I think right. it, it made their games probably more impressive for Disney and for what Disney wanted to show was basically their obsession with animation. I think Sega kind of fulfilled that partnership a lot better than Capcom did. So I would Absolutely. say yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, it's worth checking out. We cited a lot on this show, but uh, Ken Horowitz is playing at the next level. Doesn't really talk about Quackshot too much because it's a Japanese development and that game covers American developed games. But there is an interesting chapter on Fantasia, the video game, and kind of where that game fell apart and was not a huge success for Sega because it was basically Sega of America developers trying to ride the coattails of Castle of Illusion and Quackshot mm. and things just not working out. But it was a case of them shortly after um, these games came out, you know, uh, Disney coming to them and being like, what do you want to make? And they were probably like, we want to make Fantasia the video game. And, and Disney was like, absolutely, you can make it great. And it turned out to not be that great. Um, I don't have any memories of that game, so I can't comment on it. But I think it's interesting that uh, America was trying to strike oil and they really couldn't. But I was going to say, as seen, uh -huh. something that Disney's like struggling with lately, right? It's that they're, they're still trying to bring their IPs to uh, video games, but they haven't found the mainstream success that they found right. you know, during the 16-bit era. Um, why do you think that is? I mean, we don't really see Mickey games anymore, right? Uh, we had Epic Mickey for a while, but did that catch the yeah. world on fire? No. So Disney, they shut down Disney Interactive, which was their own in-house development studio. They also um, shut down LucasArts. Uh, and since then, they've really just been licensing out. So they do have a video game division, but all they do is handle licensing um, same with, uh, I think they call it Lucasfilm Games now, which was recently announced. They're just handling licensing and it has a small staff that work with these developers. I think the smart thing is, though, instead of making deals like they were before, where it was like exclusivity, they're spreading it around more. So like in the case of Star Wars, you're going to see other developers outside of EA working on them, which is really great. And I'm hopefully thinking this sort of thing will apply to Disney as well with like the Mickey stuff. Hopefully. Um, I'm honestly kind of shocked that like, we don't have a good pirates of the Caribbean game. Like the fact that they, that they haven't made a big open world pirates of the Caribbean game is just kind of crazy <laughs> to me. Yeah. Um, 
And the fact, again, like, yeah, they're they're not really taking advantage of this history of hardcore, fun platformers. Um, I mean, we did see the DuckTales remake and we saw Castle of Illusion remake, but those came and went. And they never really thought, oh, we should make Darkwing Duck the game and we should mm-hmm. make, um, you know, really get these uh, Disney Afternoon kids uh, who are now like in their 30s and 40s to throw money at us. I mean, it's just kind of stupid. Somebody yeah. out there probably did think of something like Darkwing Duck. I, I don't want to put any names out there, but uh, <laughs> uh, maybe like somebody that did Sonic Adventure. Mm. <laughs> uh, the Yeah, right. The, he did uh, a prototype but, for it, remember, for Capcom? Uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. Yeah. So, you know, there there were attempts to make a uh, Darkwing Duck game, but yeah, it didn't happen. So It looks sick, though. I mean, yeah. how have you seen it? Is that the one from Stealth? Yeah, the Stealth one. Yeah, yeah. That one is sweet. He spent a lot of money on that, too, I think. Oh, man. Um, yeah. But hey, let's talk about some Sega All-Stars. So let's bring up Yamamoto. So Quackshot was largely developed by the same team as Castle of Illusion, with Amiko Yamamoto acting acting as game designer and director. We discussed Yamamoto on episode 26, but it is worth repeating that she is one of many fantastic female Sega developers who went on to truly shape the industry. Yamamoto became an executive producer at Disney Interactive, and she worked on a variety of games, including the Kingdom Hearts series and the HD remake of Castle of Illusion, which kind of brought her back full circle with her career. Um, So let's take a few minutes to praise her. Um, And uh, what modern games would you like to see her work on? I will say right off the bat, Quackshot HD should have happened. And the fact... Yeah, and I'm kicking myself. I didn't include it in the notes, but we can talk about it right now. There was that April Fool's joke from the um, developers of Dragon's Trap where it was like a quack shot game with Donald and a plunger gun, and it turned out to be an April Fool's joke, but then they later were like, no, it was a real pitch that Disney turned down. Wait, so who did this? I don't remember that. You don't remember that? Yeah, so um, uh, quack shot... Let me see. Quackshot April Fools. So there was a Quackshot April Fools Day prank. Uh, you know why we didn't catch it? Because it was peak pandemic. Mm-hmm. It was April April first, twenty twenty, which is kind of a shitty time to trick people. Like this is like one month in, and we're like, we don't need this. Uh, oh yeah, you're um, right. I'm looking at it. Uh, well, was looking at it, but the way you hit on. <clears throat> you're right. It was on April first last year. I can't believe I missed this. This is crazy. I'm yeah, like, I just put it in our our Discord chat. But yeah, it's um I mean, it's definitely not it looks like the new DuckTales TV show in terms of art style. Yeah. Um Scrooge is in it, which I mean, I, I like the idea, but I kind of don't like that it's becoming a DuckTales game when the original really wasn't. But there definitely is the plunger gun there. Um Temples. It looks cool. It looks fun. I would have liked to have seen it. Didn't happen though. Um, and I don't know, maybe if, if they pitched this to Yamamoto and like she was on board, maybe she'd kind of help them make it maybe a little more like the comic books or maybe give it the art style of the original games. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a purist, but I would have loved to see something like that. Um, I also will just say that I think Sega as a game development company is kind of progressive just in the fact that whenever we look at the history of a lot of these games, there's a lot of really strong female developers that I don't really know if you see at other studios. Yeah, Um, definitely. Like, especially for this early, maybe Capcom, I would say like the, the early Japanese studios were pretty progressive for like all the stuff that like, uh, how, I guess, what do they say? Conservative Japan is as a country. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just, it's, I don't know, makes me feel good about the company because it's not just a bunch of chain-smoking Japanese men. We have some chain, chain-smoking chain Japanese women, women too. Yeah, <laughs> Everybody yeah, yeah exactly. Say, yeah. How'd you like my game? <laughs> um, so, uh, so good on her. And then we also have another superstar here. So we have 
Um, well, first off, if, if some of the enemies in the game, in my opinion, look like Knuckles, it's probably because you're seeing the work of his designer, Takashi Yuda. Yuda worked as the art director for the game and served as an artist on all the Illusion games, as well as a character designer and animator for Sonic 3 and Knuckles, and he later worked on the Space Channel 5 series as a director. Is that, um, so you can see Yuda. Is that mm-hmm. why like Sonic Sonic 3 and Knuckles has kind of like a different art style? Like Sonic looks totally I, different from 2 to 3, right? I think so because when you look at the when you look at the sprite work for Quackshot especially, I think it has more in common with Sonic 3. Mhm. In terms of aesthetics and I, just like shading, when we and, did an episode on mm-hmm. two, I think we we I showed all yeah. three, and you said something you didn't like how Sonic had like shiny things on the nose, and then when I was we were yeah. looking at the gameplay of the Duck game, something I noticed is that he always had the little like shade on his on his beak, so it was like dark, it wouldn't be there, but if it was like in a sunset, it would be like a bright orange thing right there. It was weird, like he. So like I'm assuming the little details like that, the little shiny bits were you know. It mm-hmm. are totally him, and it definitely shows in three. I think, but what do you, absolutely. I, and let's bring up that screen. So I have one uh, here. It's Knuckles in the notes. Um, oh yeah. So I took I took the Knuckles sprite and I put him in <laughs> Quack Shot, where like a uh, flames coming at his head. Yeah, he's just but showing. you can see the similarities. Yeah, you know, he could have been in here as part of a character. Yeah, absolutely. Like you look, like you're saying with the the little shiny bits. Like there's some little glean on those guys' noses, um, and then just in terms of like knuckles design, the long uh, tan colored snout, the angry eyes. I mean, those other guys they kind of look like echidnas if they had little Red. little Rasta hats yeah. on. Yeah. Um, so I, I just thought that was kind of an interesting little bit there, and I always like to bring that fact up because it gets Sonic fans to check this game out. Um, you know how those Sonic fans are. They're like, oh, I don't play it. And then you go, the, you know, the guy who did Sonic Rush's soundtrack did the music from Jet Set Radio. And they're like, oh, I got to play that. Of course. And then like a month later, a month later, their like Avatar images beat. <laughs> and Different. and it's like lifelong Jet Set Radio fan in their bio. <laughs> so, you know, it's how it happens. Whatever it takes to bring them over to the good side. Absolutely. <laughs> um. So yeah, let's let's talk about the reviews. I, I thought these were pretty interesting. Quack Shot, it released to glowing reviews, averaging nine out of ten. UK magazine Ace said, and I love this quote: uh, "Quack Shot proves anything Mickey can do, Donald can do better. Not only does Quack Shot play like a dreamy treat, that must be like a a British." term i don't know the gameplay is consistently challenging providing a constant and deeply enjoyable challenge the reviewer even said i'd rather play this than the hugely overrated sonic any day of the week so this christmas forget hype the hedgehog and plug the duck in your slot you'd have to be quackers not to this guy hated sonic i bet you he still hates sonic i bet he's on twitter right now going like Sonic the Hedgehog is the most overrated 30 years of any franchise in history. Does this guy write You're for... You're probably uh, right. He probably writes for IGN. <laughs> I tried to find him because I did post this up, this like screenshot up on Twitter. You couldn't find um, him. But I couldn't find him. Maybe he died. Maybe he like... <laughs> maybe he's writing hard selling like million, million plus selling books. Maybe he's a jazz musician or something. Maybe. Um... Sega Power, meanwhile, awarded the game gold, and they cited excellent graphics, sound effects, and noted Donald having a star quality. What? Okay. Um, they also noted that hardened Sonic players might find it a bit slow, which I guess I could see, but like, this is coming off of Sonic 1, which had arguably some of the slowest gameplay in the series. So, yeah. you know... Um, and the, and the thing is, Quackshot can move fast if you use the dash, if you use the, um, belly slide, and if you collect those red hot chili peppers, but my, my, and you go crazy. My thing is like, okay, like, can you imagine playing like, uh, Mario and they're like, you might enjoy Mario, but it's not as fast as Sonic. Just letting you know. It's like, right. yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, there's a lot of games that are not as fast as Sonic. You know that, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then, like I mentioned, Disney gave Sega first right of refusal, 
which kind of beats any sales figures or review scores. Because, I mean, really, Sega made two very good games, and then Disney was like, all right, we opened the door to you. And I'm sure this game could have bombed, like, shortly thereafter, and Sega would be like, we're good. You know, we <laughs> we got the Disney, the Disney contract. So, um, how would you rate the game? I mean... I guess so, out of 10. <laughs> um, I mean, I haven't completed the game, but like for what I've played and what I've enjoyed, I can't give it a final score, obviously, but I will say as a person that's played a lot of like Disney and tie-in Disney games, the market mm-hmm. for these kind of licensed games is super dodgy, right? So if you have a company game that's like a 7 out of 10, when it's a licensed game, it's like it, it, it kind of has to go up a couple points because they're so trashy, you know. <laughs> like when you play the Garfield yeah. like uh, racing game compared to like Sonic, you know, it's like huge, you know, like Mario Racing versus Garfield Racing, and like this one is probably one of the better platformers at the uh, at the time. So it definitely deserves all the ra- uh, r- uh, raving reviews because, dude, I used to play. One of my first Disney games I bought was uh, Mousecapade on NES, and that game it looks oh. terrible. And it, I don't know if it's te- I don't know if it's considered terrible nowadays. But I there's think a, it is. Yeah, because and I used to be all into it just because it had Mickey in it, and I was a kid and I loved Mickey, so that's all it needed to be. The fact that they made these like high quality animated games uh, based on the license, mm-hmm. yeah, that kind of throws it over the top in my opinion. The way that the characters look and represented makes a huge difference in my opinion in these games. And these were the first times early on where Disney characters actually felt like they moved like the animation on TV. So I think it's a pretty big deal for you know licensed games. What about you? Does it deserve it? Oh yeah, I mean, I I definitely rate this game a nine out of ten. I think it's a very solid game. Um, of course, you know, if younger kids probably would get stuck, just not being used to the nonlinear aspect. But I mean, all in all, I I don't have any major complaints about the game. There's no stupid like uh, currency system. It's not like you need to buy weapons constantly. There's not an item shop. There's really nothing in it that's cheap. Um, you know, it's, it's really easy to build up lives. It's really easy to stay alive because you have such a good energy bar. Um, all in all, just like a really solid game. And I think the only shame is that the advertising for it was just kind of not really there as we'll see in these next images. Mm. Um, this one's from tech toy Brazil. Uh, so I can't read this (laughs) because I don't read what, yeah. Is this Portuguese? Is that yeah, what they? It, yeah, it's not Spanish. Um, yeah, but I, my favorite part is down below. It says "ha ha ha." <laughs> I was going to say, like, He's, as a designer, isn't there isn't there like a lot of empty empty space here? Like, they could have put in the mountains, and it's just reusing the same art, but they flipped it. Yeah, I I, I see what you're saying. I think Sonic Sonic Donald's eyes are very wonky because here it too. wasn't designed to be this way, right? Yeah, it wasn't designed to be flipped, and he was supposed to be looking at something, and so to have him just, like, flipped and looking nowhere <laughs> is really like bizarre. One eye's looking at yeah. his uh, one eye's looking at his gun, and the other eye's looking at us. He's in for the kill. <laughs> exactly. Like, you cover, you cover the different <laughs> eyes, and they really should be in different places. Um, this next one we have is... Um, now, this, this is in Spanish, right? I think so. I, I it's so small. Let me look at it. Ya ya está aquí el unico. El pato donal. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's pr- protagonist. Um, and again, el, el, Donald Duck basically in Spanish, but yeah. This is a grand opportunity for Donald. <laughs> so <laughs> so funny. Sega's little like uh phrase here was Viva la invent- aventura which is uh live the adventure that was, that used to be their Spanish slogan for Sega. That's not great. <laughs> That's kind of hey, awful. Live the adventure Sega. There you go. Wait, so and in the red and the red bits does this say a genuine I mean Don- uh, the genuine Donald let me see. It says, "Yeah, it, yeah, the genuine, genuine Don, Donald." The 
can't even read what it says. I'm so terrible at Spanish. Mas, mas enfadado que nunca tu mejor pato aventuras ya en tu Mega oh. Drive, Master System 2 y Game Gear. Why are they mentioning Master System 2 and Game Gear? Uh, I don't know. They had a version of it on the on the Game Gear. No, they didn't. They didn't. <laughs> but you can but play we it will on see if, if we not? go to the next ad. Uh, this is a Japanese ad. You can see they wow. do have Quack Shot alongside the Lucky Dime Caper, which was a Donald adventure on the Game Gear, but it definitely was not Quack Shot. It was a completely no. different game. Um, I like how happy he Donald Duck is in the Japanese ads. Look how happy he is just shooting his little toilet gun and his little kids are just like, go, <laughs> Donald. Well, that's because we told him we love him. We love Donald Duck. And he's like, aw. But the he's other so one's happy. like, quack shot. And he's like, did you say quack shit? <laughs> What'd you say? And you're like, no, 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 quack shot. And he's like, he does that wonky eye. Mm. Mm. Uh, and then the next page I just threw in here because I posted this up on Twitter last week um oh god it's a really weird gumby sonic ad uh <laughs> i love his long body yeah so this was on the opposite page so imagine that you open the oh. spread and you're like oh quack shot lucky dime caper and then gumby sonic i like how sega selling you a watch dude on the same ad with the wonky sonic it's like after i see wonky sonic the last thing i want is a watch <laughs> like and like an entertainment cabinet Hey. To hold your Genesis. Yeah. I wonder if we could ever find one of those, like the Japanese one. Like, I want to be rolling up on the next podcast with my Sega Golden Watch and my uh, entertainment <laughs> cabinet in the back with my Genesis stuff. Absolutely. Well, talk to, uh, what is it, Danny. He got one of those new watches. Those are pretty sweet. Oh, yeah. Didn't the president send it to him? That's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> the president the, but Joe Biden? <laughs> <laughs> yeah joe biden i want you to have this watch it says sega on it i don't know what it means um but it sounds good i like it uh so yeah there, uh, we also have some videos i was actually surprised to find commercials i've never seen these so let's first watch the japanese commercial which one for is quack the, shot and let me see it's the, the first of the two videos is that the one that says uh oh no that's a streets of rage one the one from sega 16 right yeah that's right yeah all right i just want to make sure because usually sega 16 is american but i mean they archive everything yeah let me just make sure it looks good in our video <laughs> all right i'll press play here we go Wow. It shows a lot of gameplay. And then yeah. the happy son the, the happy Wow, what's the second one? Oh, romance. For of the some three reason teams. romance of the three. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. don't know why. Yeah, it's a double feature of the commercials. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's an all right commercial. It's very typical Japanese with the Japanese guys, like just yelling at you, kind of like in America, where it's like, oh, your next door neighbor, the guy that uh, is always banging girls. Yeah, he plays Donald Duck Quackshaw. You should play da- <laughs> that Donald Duck Quackshaw. Your, your dad's not cool enough to play Donald Duck Quackshaw. He sucks. Is dude. that what he's saying in Japanese? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I know Japanese a little bit. Now, this, I, this <laughs> next ad, I love. I posted because, a clip of it up on our Twitter. Yeah, because it has us in it. It's so good. It's so good. So let's just let it play and enjoy it. Oh, the mullet? I have a mullet going on right now, too. Freeze the rage. Hey. Hey. They two hot games, eh? It's... And that's it. And then yeah. the next one has, I think, a young George playing uh, Sonic. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's yeah. You. I was going to say, uh, yeah. <laughs> what do you think about that part where he's like, Streets Rage? <laughs> he goes like, Quack Shot and Streets of Games, just two. Rage, two hot names for the games, games, games. It's like weird. <laughs> That's so lame. <laughs> I love it, dude. My That's... favorite, my favorite uh, bit is three seconds in that one guy going like this, like doing the Arsenio. Oh, right away. Yeah. 
yeah! Like, are they really playing quack shot? Are they? Oh my god, this no. guy is too into it. Look at this guy, dude. Yeah, we gotta. He's get going. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, 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 yes, dude, I, yes. <laughs> I, and it, if you ever make a video or you make it like you're just talking on the camera and explaining the game and you make a joke and you need to, you need one of those like fake claps, you gotta have that guy and you're just sliced in the video. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, that guy is into it, man. I've never seen someone so into I'm gonna, it. I'm going to take this, but I'm going to replace all the quack shot and Streets of Rage footage with, like, Jeopardy and Clue. And it's like, <laughs> Gameplay of it. Jeopardy and Clue on the Sega Genesis. Two hot names for the games, games, games. And that guy's going, yeah, Jeopardy! <laughs> Clue! <laughs> yeah, we'll it. see. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's not too much to say about quack shot in terms of... Uh, it's future, but Donald did return in the third I Love game, World of Illusion, though the game itself played much more like Castle of Illusion and was very linear. Um, but there was a two-player component, which I thought was kind of uh, unique and made it a lot of fun. Um, but honestly, very little, if anything, introduced in Quackshot carried over to World of Illusion. Um, there is a fun little Easter egg, though, in the HD remake of Castle of Illusion, you can unlock two costumes, well, three. One of them is a knight of knight in shining armor if you complete the game. Second one, if you collect five chili peppers, you get to unlock an explorer costume for Mickey, which is a nod to Quackshot. And then mm. uh, the other costume is a magician referencing World of Illusion. So right there, they very clearly make it like the trilogy. Um I wish he had the Indiana Jones hat, but it's still kind of cool. He's got the little pith helmet. Um, yeah, so that's that's what we got. I mean, that's that's our show. We did it. Um, we do have memories, though. But is are there any final thoughts you have to say about Donald Duck and Quackshot before we move on? They need to bring more Duck games over. Um, where's the, what was the other one that they just did a, a re-release of? It was like uh, it was with Stooge McDuck, the one where you use his cane. The Capcom one? DuckTales. Yeah, yeah. So, like, they, they brought that back. I feel like maybe Ca Disney should just allow more companies to either remake these games or, like, <clears throat> have somebody, like, I don't know, Head Cannon make, I don't know, like a Darkwing Duck game or a Donald Duck game. <laughs> that would be sweet. Yeah, that would be sweet. There was the um, Aladdin and Lion King 2-pack that came out of nowhere. Oh, I don't yeah, know if you picked yeah. that up, yeah, I but it's it. so cool because it has the, uh, I believe it has the Genesis, SNES, and even like Game Boy and Game Boy Color versions. I've never seen a Game Boy Color game on like <laughs> PS4, which yeah. is just so bizarre. But um, if only they could do something like that for the trilogy and just give it a straight up um, re-release like that. I do know that Castle of Illusion actually received a digital release alongside the remake, but only on PS3. Do you remember that? Yeah, they gave you the first game, right? If you pre-ordered it or something? Yeah, but only on PS3 and only for pre-orders. It was so bizarre. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's a great game. It's just a shame that it's kind of just a ROM on a Genesis. You know, like, you can't really play it anywhere else. There's no context, no behind-the-scenes stuff going on. Um, it'd be fun bring it back but you know in the meantime we do have our memories so first off i'm going to read a patreon memory we have here from h who is a recent patron uh they say who is donald duck i never knew this game was made i'll try it and what so h thank donald you so duck? much it's not what is h what does what h is mean h? <laughs> it, i think it means huh because it make huh? when i hear those when i read it i go huh um, we also have a memory I reached out to Aki at, who is a contributor to Sega Bits. He does our financial reports and stuff. Um, he is also a game developer. And so, yeah, he, he had this to say. Um, he is the creator of Rock Crocodile. You can check him out on Twitter, YouTube, all that sort of good stuff. Um, so I'm just going to read it here. Uh, Quackshot was Sega's second major attempt at of using the Disney IP after they successfully got into the House of Mouse's good books and to this day remains one of my favorite platformers. What, what Quackshot lacked in the technical marvel Sonic the Hedgehog brought just a few months before, it made up with character and charm. 
with some clever gameplay designs that made the game feel like true globetrotting adventure. This game has simple enough premise. You control Donald Duck as he searches for the lost treasure of King Garuzia. What made it stand out from its contemporaries was the simple executions that gave the game extra depths that other platformers lacked. What shows off in the opening level on your first playthrough, the game is linear and short, and the player gets to the end and it's blocked off by a wall. However, later in the game, you're granted a plunger, which allows Donald to scale over walls. When the player returns, they can now scale and continue to the new area. The, this shows the basic essence of Quackshot, that more, it's more than meets the eye. When the player takes on Transylvania, the paintings that follow the player, the giant ghost that evaporates into a dozen smaller ghosts, there are many moments that most other games at the time would reuse and beat it until it became repetitive, but Quackshot made it a point not to overstay its welcome and keep the player in awe. A true classic from Sega and one I would encourage more players to try out. So yeah, I, I totally agree. Thank you, Aki, for that. And that's it for the show. George, do you want to tell people what they can expect next episode? I'm talking to Ty- Taylor, Tyler, and he's giving, he told me uh, Valkyrie Chronicles, but we're also talking about Panzer Dragon Saga, so there's going to be one of those two games. I, I think he might want to do Va- Valkyrie Chronicles this month and maybe next month, Panzer Dragon. But uh, Valkyrie Chronicles most likely in two weeks. If not, Panzer Dragon Saga. I guess it's a, it'll be a surprise. Both games are great. We'll see next week. All right, sounds good. So from myself and George, thanks for listening or watching. And remember, Sega... I don't know. Bye. That's it. Bye. Bye. (laughs) All right.